Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar titled County and State Data Mapping the Mental Health of Our Communities, Leveraging MHA's Unique County and State Data. I am Teresa Nguyen, um, MHA's Chief Program Officer, and we are so excited to have this webinar to help kick off the launch of our new data dashboard, which can be found on the MHA website. It went live today. Um, Maddie will be providing that link in the chat for you. So if you wanna go on the website and play with it as we talk about the opportunities that um, will hopefully stem from this awesome project, uh, you can do that on the website. Um, before I introduce today's presenters, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded. The, demonstra um, the demonstration portion of the recording will be available on MHA's website um, on the link that was provided in the chat box um, to your right. Um, closed captioning is also available. Today, for today's webinar, you can access that um, by clicking the CC or live transcript um, button at the bottom below. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please feel free to type your comment into the chat box and somebody can assist you with any of your challenges. Um, during our webinar, you are also welcome to type your questions for our presenters in the chat box, and we will try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. With that said, I want to introduce you to our speakers. Kicking off our webinar is Deborah Dunsire um, and Schroeder Stribling. Uh, Dr. Deborah is the president and CEO of Lundbeck, a global pharmaceutical company specialized in brain diseases with more than 70 years of expertise in neuroscience research. Dr. Dunsire has more than 30 years of clinical, commercial, and international management experience from the biotech and pharmaceutical industry, primarily in the fields of oncology and CNS, thus bringing a breadth of scientific and business experience. Schroeder Stribling is the president and CEO of Mental Health America. Schroeder has been a, law, a lifelong social justice advocate with over 20 years of experience managing organizations focused on mental health, homelessness, poverty, and racial justice. Prior to joining MHA, Schroeder was a CEO at End Street Village, a nonprofit providing housing support for women and families in Washington, D.C., and was a social worker at Johns Hopkins Bayview Hospital, implementing new mental health programs in the inner city Head Start school system and working with individuals with dual diagnoses. Following Deborah and Schroeder is a demonstration of our platform by Maddie Reiner. Maddie is MHA's Senior Director of Population Health. In her role at MHA, Maddie is responsible for cleaning, analyzing, interpreting, and reporting qualitative and quantitative data for use across MHA programming. She provides regular data support to over 80 partners nationally and supports our research and innovation and policy team with research, writing, and disseminating public health and policy findings. I want to thank our speakers um, for their time today and thank you, our attendees, for joining us. And now I'm going to turn it over to Deborah and Schroeder. Well, thank you so much, Teresa. Um, I want to thank you, especially our Chief Program Officer here at Mental Health America. I'm so grateful to Teresa and our other colleague, Maddie, whom you'll hear from, who have done really extraordinary work on this project. And Deborah, it's so nice to see you today. And I want to start by personally thanking you and Lundbeck for this partnership that we have uh, forged together, which has enabled the critical progress that we're proud to debut today in the data mapping dashboard. Uh, it's the result of a full year's work together in developing four major publications, analyzing real-time data about mental health trends during the pandemic. Uh, we are so grateful for Lundbeck's focus on mental health and your investment in pursuing solutions, something we greatly appreciate and which is very synergistic with our mission here at Mental Health America. Just a bit of background on Mental Health America, we're the oldest national mental health organization in the US. We work with and through our 200 member organizations across the country, 
Our primary objective is to promote mental health as fundamental to overall health and wellness for everyone. And we place a heavy emphasis on prevention and early identification, especially for those at risk, which is where this groundbreaking project with you comes in. We also advocate for integrated care, culturally responsive and accessible services for all, community and peer-based support and policy advancement, which supports all of those. Ultimately, we promote the hope and possibility of recovery for all who seek it. So once again, I'm very pleased to be here with you today to discuss this partnership project and the mapping dashboard, which illuminates the dramatic, but not surprising rise in mental health conditions during the pandemic. So thank you, Schroeder, for that uh, kind welcome. It's great to be here. This is the culmination of a lot of work, uh, particularly the, using the dashboard and the screening tool from Mental Health America. And for Lundbeck, a company that's focused in restoring brain health and has been for 70 years, as you said, as the pandemic wave overwhelmed all of us, we were so struck by its impact, not only on the physical health, which of course was all around us, but the impact of on mental health from the disease itself, which can affect the brain, but also from the social isolation and the other impacts that we suddenly found in this period of change. And so having this partnership pre-existing with Mental Health America, it made perfect sense for us to reach out to Mental Health America and say, what is it that we could potentially do together at this moment in history that could highlight and make more accessible data on how mental health is being affected? And what an amazing outcome this has been. And we're so excited for this debut today of the tool and how it's working and as well as the publications that have already been released. So thank you for this partnership. Thank you for the work that you and your team do on behalf of people facing mental ill health, be it temporary, be it longer term, knowing that there is a helping hand is so appreciated. Well, I, I would say the same uh, as well in this partnership. You have been a helping hand to us. Um, and I think this, this partnership is an example of what we can do together when we get very focused on something such as the urgent needs of the country during an unprecedented time, as you say, of stress and ill health and disruptions which abounded for all. Um, our screening program was a natural place for us to connect and to advance this project together. We launched the screening program in 2014, and as you know, it is a unique, anonymous, free, and online program that is especially useful now because what we get from it is real-time data. This is the largest real-time data set available. Federal data sets are often delayed by a year or two years. So especially in this time of the pandemic, we knew it was this would take on an outsized importance, allowing us to look at what's happening in the country in full. And then also through this dashboard to get more granular by looking at states and counties. And this is an extraordinary advancement that will help local leaders in those communities understand what the specific needs are that they need to address and how to drive solutions and resources um, toward those communities. One overarching impression that we can give about what we've seen as the major trends during the pandemic is that the number of people who came to access the screening program increased from uh, 1 million in 2019 to 2.6 million in 2020. So that tells us something in and of itself about how many people uh, were, were in distress during this time. So this has been uh, particularly, as we say, um, important in getting to see people with needs as early as possible, which is consistent with um, your objectives and ours to get to folks quickly Get them, get them getting started, getting help connected to supports, uh, which is what we've been able to do through this, a start through this data project. 
You know, it's so interesting that you say that because what we what we saw during the pandemic was a huge increase in the conversation around mental ill health, particularly anxiety and depression, but a concomitant decrease in the capability for people to actually access some of the formal care settings because of the isolation rules, the lockdown rules. So in some ways, a double whammy yes. of an increased threat level with a decreased ability to access already slim resources. And so the opening up of the data with this tool, first of all, the acknowledgement, yes, we're more than doubling the number of people who are finding the need for help in the movement from 1 million to 2.7, I think you said million people seeking that diagnosis, but being able to isolate the data sets on county and state level to be able to bring to policymakers and say, here is the issue. How do we address it in your county, in your state? Giving them tools to be able to argue for resources is, is just such a powerful uh, addition to their toolbox, the ability yes. to argue for fact. Yes, I, I couldn't agree with you more. We, of course, closely track issues around access in general and have been for a long time. And access can include everything from affordability to the uh, location of people's ability to get to services, the ability even to navigate the system, to reach the help that they need, to find quality and culturally responsive services. So access has long been an issue. And precisely as you say, our lockdowns and our isolation and our shortages of workers and services because of skyrocketing demands on the health system on all fronts. And also things like school closures, which is another place where access is often achieved for young people in need. So all of this had a bearing on our great concern about access during the pandemic. We have talked about some of the ways that to mitigate that and the dashboard will really help the local leaders and policymakers and others drive those solutions. For instance, telehealth became uh, of outsized importance as an access issue during the pandemic. So th this is something that I, I agree with you will help us navigate those access issues as we come out of this time, hopefully. I think you mentioned something that's critical is that, that there are fewer resources in terms of counselors, uh, psychiatrists, the ability to access qualified caregivers. And so how do we maximize uh, the, the ability of those people resources to be able to provide care? And, and telehealth is certainly one of those uh, tools. And of course, insurers then provided the access to providers being paid for telehealth. And so that's another policy area that we can focus upon. But I want to come back to something that you, you honed in on a little bit. We've seen over the years a rise in mental illness from younger people and anxiety, depression, even suicide risk that in, in younger people that even got more accentuated. So tell me a little bit about the data set and, and what it showed about these vulnerable populations. Yes, and this is something that I think the new dashboard illuminates and, and all of our reports this year that we did together illuminate very, very clearly that the dashboard will help us look at a hyper local level. So at those states and the counties. So we're talking about geography and helping folks in those geographies design and drive solutions. But then we're also talking about specific populations of people who are at risk and whom we want to to reach. So that data is also enormously important. And in all four of the reports that we worked on uh, through this project together, depression, suicide risk, trauma, PTSD, and psychosis, the same three groups came up as highest risk in all of those. Youth was definitely one of them. Young people, 11 to 17, 
seen 11 to 17, we saw enormous numbers of youth coming to screen themselves for concerns. And one can imagine the, the disruptions in their lives are not only the same as, as ours, but they're unique to them. All of the missed developmental milestones, all of the missed social connections uh, in school and that social and emotional growth and learning that's happening during this time and, and all of the time online, which in some ways is probably positive, but carries its, its risks as well. So youth came out as definitely high risk, but also to mention the other two groups that came out as highest risk in each of the reports, individuals of color, communities of color, and low income individuals and communities. So we are very concerned that we get this message out quite clearly through the reports that we've done and now through the mapping dashboard so that we can know both about geography and about specific people and populations. Yeah, I mean, it, it's such a rich data set and coming at a time where not only are we experiencing a global pandemic, but also the heightened uh, awareness of the impact of people of color, people of different ethnicities, and what their life ex lived experience is like, certainly showed up in the data as in heightening the risk of experiencing these symptoms of anxiety, depression, other uh, mental illnesses. But I think there was also, along with that, those areas of people feeling a little bit isolated, a little bit different, that the LGBTQ community was also at risk. And I think being able to highlight this for policymakers, for caregivers, is something that uniquely enables programming or resources to be directed in an even more efficient way. Absolutely, and I'm so glad that you mentioned that because you're completely right that that was another very, very high risk category. Folks who are in the LGBTQ community, queer identified in some way, people who identified themselves as non-binary um, in the optional demographics that people left us, which are all, all so useful in getting to, to these, to understand which specific populations are at the highest risk. So, and there are many of those too that are intersectional. So it, youth who are LGBTQ, youth of color, youth living in poverty. So we know where the hot spots are. And it's really something that I think, again, having the data will help to drive the solutions. So I guess what we're, we're seeing is that there's a need for policy intervention. And I know you advocate tirelessly for that. What are the other things that we can potentially see uh, driving action coming out of this? Well, which data set? I think we're starting with uh, today. I think that the, the debut of this uh, mapping dashboard and the ability for policymakers, local leaders, educators, parents, interested public to be able to see the data for themselves will help them know how to drive resources. We have, of course, at Mental Health America, a national network of affiliates. Many of them work on policy solutions and also many of them do direct services. So they will be able to advocate for their county, their specific geography, or their specific population. Let's say if they have a youth focus or an LGBTQ focus. Um, so we will be looking to disseminate this data as widely as possible to those who are providing direct services, to those policymakers who are watching the data and who need the data in order to advocate uh, with their, their peers and colleagues for the solutions overall. So the public messaging is, is very important. And I, I would add to just on a, I think a sensitivity note about solutions that part of the message is not only to policymakers and leaders, but we also wanna be reaching people because all of each one of these data points is a person. And we never wanna forget that. And we want people to know first and foremost, 
which is made quite clear in the data, you are not alone. Um, this is affecting so many. And so many of us all can speak to the effects of this time, especially this is important for those who have indicated the deep distress that they're in. I think that public message is also uh, very, very important. I'm so glad you pointed that out because I think that feeling of aloneness drives people deeper into despair. Um, and one of the things that's been interesting during this pandemic as a, as a person who's passionate about uh, raising awareness about mental health is that we've heard more talk in so many different arenas of life about the impact of the pandemic on mental health. So maybe a little chink in the armor of stigma that has so long uh, been a part of mental illness. How, how have you seen that aspect and, and how do you see that going forward? Well, I, I completely agree with you. And I think that it, it, um, at the risk of sounding too optimistic in, in, a, in what has been a, a dark chapter for all of us, I think this is the, the potential silver lining uh, for mental health is that we have an opportunity to really double down on our anti-stigma efforts because there has been so much more public discourse. I can remember back to the very beginning of the pandemic with Michelle Obama publicly acknowledging that she was experiencing some mild depression. That this has enormous positive impact and our athletes Simone Biles and others who have come forward are other public figures who've come forward to shine a light on this, not only about other people, but talking about themselves and making it okay for people to talk about their own lived experience during this time, which has been different for so many people. There has been, of course, very traumatic experiences for many, mildly traumatic, definitely stressful and disruptive for everyone. But it is a moment when the conversation is in the air. And I think we don't want to lose this opportunity as the health effects begin to calm down. We at Mental Health America do believe that the mental health impact is going to have a longer tail to, toward resolution and that there will be effects, especially I think for our youth for years to come and we need to have a laser focus on helping youth be prepared uh, and and have the resources they need to be as mentally well and healthy going on into the future and part of that for them is continuing to work on this anti-stigma campaign that we, that Mental Health America has been on for uh, uh, all of its uh, more than 120 years and which I know you at Lundbeck are, are certainly also committed to. So I agree with you, that is a potential bright spot in, a, in what's been a difficult time. Yeah, and I, you know, I think of some of the programs in Medicare and Medicaid that, that could be expanded are those are those areas that you'll focus on in advocacy? Are there are there areas we, and of course the many many panelists who are with us today, are there are there areas we could focus on advocating for expansion? Absolutely true. Medicaid expansion. We know the effect of Medicaid expansion. We're able to see it. Mental Health America produces a uh, an annual national report on the states uh, and the prevalence of mental health conditions and the ability of people to access mental health services. And continually what we see in that report is that the states that have expanded Medicaid are doing better than those who have not. So we have clear data that tell us that ex the expansion of Medicaid is going to be, um, is important and that we need to continue to, to focus on that from a policy perspective. Also, Medicare's collaborative care model um, has had a, a significant impact and there's data behind that too. We know that in where it's been studied, there's an over 40% reduction in depression symptoms with, with Medicare's collaborative care model. So that's something that we need to, uh, to focus on um, in addition.
Oh, I'm sorry. I've lost here. I lost uh, the audio. I, I, I apologize. That's okay. Probably That's okay. one of those Zoom mute moments. <laughs> but it's going to be very interesting to see the, the demonstration of the, yes. of the database. And, uh, you know, I know we're, we're looking forward to that. Um, is there anything that we should take away before we go to that? is the most important things we can focus on in our advocacy to support your efforts, which I, I know are tireless and, and broad, but you can use the army behind you, I'm sure. Well, thank you for asking that. And thank you for being a part of the army behind us. Uh, you have been an invaluable partner in making this possible. And we believe that this is a groundbreaking project that will have a national impact that is critical for, for everyone. So there's great power in what we've done together and there's great power in bringing data and bringing the story behind the data to those who are making policy decisions and making investment decisions that will incentivize the action that's needed um, to make progress. So I think we're we're on our way. We are grateful for you as part of the Army and for all of our uh, stakeholders and supporters and for our national network. We're just enormously grateful and hopeful that this project will uh, will do what we think it has the power to do. So thank you again. Um, and with that, I think now we can pass it on to see an actual demonstration of the project. So I will pass the digital baton to our senior director of um, population health, Maddie Reinert, who will discuss the mapping data. And Deborah, thank you again for this conversation and thank you for your partnership. Thank you to Mental Health America for all that you do on behalf of pe people facing the challenges of mental ill health. Uh, it's inspiring to see what's been accomplished. Thank you, Schroeder. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful conversation, Schroeder and Deborah, and thank you all again for being here today. I'm Maddie Reinert. I'm MHA's Senior Director of Population Health, and I am so excited to be able to debut our MHA County and State Mapping Dashboard to you all and share this data for people to begin to use across the country. Just as a very quick bit of housekeeping before we get started, we will have a bit of time following this demonstration to answer any questions you may have about the dashboard. So please feel free to send them in the chat or in the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen as they come up. In the chat, we'll also put the link to the dashboard once again, so you can follow along or explore it as I walk through some of its capabilities. So I'll begin by giving a little bit more context as to where the data used in the dashboard come from and what it means. And then we'll turn to look at the dashboard itself. As Schroeder mentioned, a key part of MHA's efforts toward early identification and intervention for mental health conditions is our online screening program, which is a collection of 10 free, anonymous, confidential, and clinically validated screening tools that allow people to explore their mental health concerns online and receive immediate results and resources. We launched screening as part of our belief that everyone should have access to mental health screens and be able to build greater understanding of their own mental health concerns. These are the same tools that would be used to screen for mental health conditions in a provider's office, but we've put them online where we found people often search for answers when they're first experiencing a mental health condition, so we can meet people with immediate results and resources where and how they're searching for them. Since its launch in 2014, nearly 13 million people have completed a screen, including 2.6 million in 2020 and 5.4 million in 2021, making this the largest data set ever collected from a help seeking population for mental health conditions. And to explain what I mean by help seeking, if this is the first time you're hearing about our data, each year, about 80 to 85% of our users are organic users, meaning they're finding the mental health screening tools largely from search engines like Google or Bing by searching things like, am I stressed or depressed? I see ghosts or shadows. I want to die. Or even searching things like mental health quiz or depression test. 
So the majority of people who come to take a mental health screen are experiencing something or want to know more about their mental health and are actively searching for resources when they land on our site. Because of that, for each of these conditions in the dashboard, a high percentage of individuals who take a screen ultimately do screen at high risk or with moderate to severe symptoms, because by the time they come to our screen, site to take a screen, they are already experiencing mental health challenges. Our data also skews younger with about two thirds of our users under the age of 24, which aligns with the lifespan development of mental health conditions when someone would be first experiencing those symptoms. Because of that, we're reaching individuals who are early in their experience with a mental health condition. Most have never been diagnosed with a mental health condition before and have never received any kind of treatment or support for their mental health in their lives. In 2020, for example, 75% of all individuals who took a mental health screen scored at risk or with moderate to severe symptoms of a mental health condition. And of those individuals who scored at risk, 64% had never received any prior supports for their mental health. Before initiating care for a new mental health condition or seeking care for a relapse of symptoms from an existing mental health condition, people are likely to turn to the internet to seek information and solutions about their concerns. So this data is incredibly important for prevention and early intervention because the individuals that you see represented in this data on this dashboard are often early in their experience with a mental health condition, likely have not been diagnosed or have not yet presented in a health system, are experiencing moderate to severe symptoms of mental illness, and are actively looking for more information and supports to make sense of the new mental health issues that they're struggling with. This is a convenient sample and therefore can be interpreted as a minimum unmet need for immediate resources and support across the US in 2020 and 2021. But for everyone who came to take a screen on MHA screening within each state and county you see, there are likely many more who are currently struggling with their mental health. So when someone comes onto our website and takes a screen, they fill out the screening tool itself, and then we have a number of optional demographic questions to answer. Every user has to answer the questions on the screening tool to submit, but can choose to answer the demographic questions or not before receiving their results. Two of these optional demographic questions are state and zip code, and that is how we've built the data mapping dashboard based on that voluntary location information. We began this work by convening a series of virtual sessions with partners from different sectors, including our federal partners at CDC, SAMHSA and NIMH, researchers, providers, other mental health advocacy organizations, school advocates and industry stakeholders who were experts in the various conditions that we examined to identify gaps and opportunities that can be explored through our data on a dashboard. The goal of this dashboard is to be able to publicly share this data with community so we can reach communities that may not otherwise have access to this kind of mental health data and be able to know in near real time without the delay that we face with most data sets what the current need is across the country. It also allows us to see hotspots of highest imminent need for mental health supports so we can make more informed real time decisions create new programming and help us figure out how we can best provide individuals and communities with resources and supports where they are. So now let's turn to the dashboard itself and I'll walk you through all of the specific data that's included in this dashboard, how it has been cleaned and how you can use it to answer some of these questions. So all of the data presented within the dashboard has been collected from January 2020 through December 2021. So it's largely reflective of mental health need during the COVID-19 pandemic. As we continue to update this dashboard with new data, we will update that date range at the top of this page. So you will always be able to know what time range we are looking at in this dashboard. For all of this data, we followed an extensive cleaning process based on the guidance we received from epidemiologists we worked with during our stakeholder engagement process. As I mentioned earlier, most individuals access our mental health screening tools organically through search engines. 
But MHA does have about 200 affiliate organizations and multiple partner organizations throughout the country that often refer people to MHA screening. So to reduce oversampling in areas where those organizations are conducting outreach, we removed all referred data and kept only those organic users in the dashboard. We also only included data for um, individuals who put in both state and zip code information and where that information matched each other, meaning the zip code was located within the reported state. And that is again, because those two questions, state and zip code are part of the optional demographic question. So not every user who comes on and takes a screen um, provides that information to us. And we clean the data to minimize error in counting repeat users so that the counts you see here in the dashboard represent individual people under each condition. So below the text at the top of the page, you will see that there are six blue buttons for you to choose from that will each show you a different dashboard for a different condition. The depression dashboard was created using data from individuals who took the patient health questionnaire nine item tool or PHQ-9 depression screen and scored with symptoms of severe depression. The suicide dashboard also explores um, data from individuals who took the PHQ-9 depression screen um, from question nine, which asked how often in the previous two weeks an individual had thoughts that they would be better off dead or of hurting themselves. The suicide dashboard maps the data from people reporting experiencing frequent suicidal ideation, which we defined as reporting thoughts that they would be better off dead or of hurting themselves more than half the days or nearly every day of the previous two weeks. The PTSD dashboard contains data from individuals who took the post-traumatic stress disorder screen and scored positive for PTSD. The trauma survivors dashboard contains data from individuals who took any of the 10 mental health screening tools on our site and self-identified as a trauma survivor in the optional demographic questions following the screening tool. So as a note, this is the only dashboard mapping data that someone self-identified with in our demographic questions, as opposed to mapping the results of one of the clinically validated mental health screening tools. The psychosis dashboard contains data from individuals who took the prodromal questionnaire brief version to screen for clinical high risk for psychosis and scored at risk for experiencing um, psychotic like experiences. And finally, the comparison dashboard allows you to explore data from all of these conditions in one location. On each of these dashboards for each data set we've provided, um, we mapped three indicators, which you'll see at the very top of each dashboard. The first is the total number of individuals who had taken the screen, so here the PHQ-9. The total number of individuals getting a positive result, as I just defined, so for the depression dashboard, that would be the total number scoring for severe depression. For suicide, that would be the total reporting frequent suicidal ideation, and so on and the total number with a positive result per 100,000 people in the population. So that will be based either on the state population, if you're viewing um, the data at the state level, or based on the county population, if you're viewing the data at the county level. For all dashboards to ensure uh, user privacy, we did build in data suppression so that counties were only included in the analysis if they had five or more individuals with a positive result. So you will see that not every county is represented in every dashboard for that reason. And a more in-depth explanation of the screening tools we use, the terminology used in the dashboard and the cleaning process for the data can be found at the methodology page of our website, which I will share the link to in the chat. So now I'll take a deeper dive into one of these dashboards to show you how it really can be used. Um, so let's take a look at the psychosis dashboard. When you decide which dashboard to view, again, you will see those three indicators at the top of the dashboard. So here for psychosis, those are the total number of responses to the PQB psychosis screen, the total number of individuals scoring at risk for psychotic like experiences, and the total number of individuals scoring at risk per 100,000 people in the population. The second thing you must do when you click on one of these dashboards is decide if you'd like to view the data at the state or county level, which is controlled by these two blue buttons here. And here I have state selected, so that's what we're viewing first. 
the map is color coded based on percentile. So the states in the lightest pink here are the top 25% of states, meaning the states with the lowest number of individuals scoring at risk for psychotic like experiences per 100,000 population. And the darkest purple are the bottom 25% of states, meaning the states with the highest number of individuals scoring at risk for psychosis per 100,000 people and therefore higher risk. And we can zoom out to see Alaska and Hawaii as well at any time on this map. When you hover over each state, you will see each of the indicators for that state, as well as the top 10 counties sorted from the county with the highest number of people scoring at risk for psychotic like experiences per 100,000 people to the 10th highest. So if we look at um, Texas, for example, Upton County in Texas has the highest number of individuals scoring at risk for psychotic like experiences per 100,000 people in that county and Swisher County, Texas has the 10th highest. On the bar graph states are sorted in ascending order, meaning they are sorted from the state with the lowest number of individuals scoring at risk for psychotic like experiences per 100,000 people here, Washington DC to the state with the highest, which for psychosis is West Virginia. If you wanted to compare a few states to each other um, without having to look through the map or through the bar graph and select them individually, you can use the state filter here. So for example, I may want to know more about this block of um, southeastern states and how they compare to one another without having to individually look through the bar graph and select each of them. So I can go to the state filter here and select Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee, and then click apply. Now you'll see that the map has changed to color code just this group of states by percentile, again, from that top 25% in the light pink to bottom 25% in the dark purple. And in the bar graph, I can also see um, just how these states compare to one another in terms of the number of individuals scoring at risk for psychotic like experiences per 100,000 people. And this may help me start to dive into questions or, or think about what is it about Alabama and Tennessee um, that causes this big jump in the number of people scoring at risk for psychotic like experiences um, from the other southeastern states. What um, resources or services are present in the other states that may not be present in those two? Or you can also take a look at the map and say, what is the difference between Alabama and Tennessee and Mississippi, for example, right next to them that is causing them to be in the lowest 25% while Mississippi um, falls more in the middle of this group of states? So this is how you can start to be able to compare states to one another in the data. And I can clear this filter here. If I am interested in the county view, I would click this blue button labeled county, and you'll see the visualizations throughout the dashboard change to show just that county level data. Here in the county map, you will also see that all counties in the United States are colored by percentile. Um, again, so counties in the lightest pink here are the top 25% of counties in the country, meaning the counties with the lowest number of individuals scoring at risk for psychotic like experiences per 100,000 population. And the darkest purple are the bottom 25% of counties with higher risk. I can also see right away in the bar graph to the right. Um, which counties in the US have the highest number of individuals scoring at risk for psychotic like experiences per 100,000 people in the county out of the entire country in this data set. So here, for example, I can see Bristol City, Virginia may immediately be identified as an area that needs additional resources. Here, the bar graph is sorted in descending order so that county Bristol City at the top um, is the county with the highest number. Um, and it's sorted down to the county with the lowest number of individuals scoring at risk per 100,000 people. And again, this can help me immediately identify counties in the country that may be in need of more resources, additional funding, or more providers and services focused on psychosis in those areas.
Um, if I were working in within an individual state, though, um, I would likely want to know which counties, not out of the entire United States, but out of my state, may have the greatest number of individuals screening at risk for psychotic like experiences and be most in need of additional resources, which is where I can use this state filter on the county level view here. So, for example, I can select um, Florida here and click apply. And when I filter to Florida, I can zoom in to get a better view and see that the color coding has changed again. So now I can immediately see the counties in Florida sorted into these quartiles from counties with the lowest number of individuals scoring at risk for psychotic like experiences per county population, the light pink, um, to the highest number of individuals scoring at risk within the county, um, the dark purple and where those are concentrated. So I can see that there is a clear difference here between um, Southern Florida, where many of these light pink counties are located, to over here in this block of dark purple counties. And that can really guide, again, where additional funding, programming, more targeted prevention policies or services may be needed within the state for individuals that are currently at risk for psychotic-like experiences and are turning to the internet looking for help. We also have a county specific filter here for you to use to find specific counties without having to search for them on the map. Or for example, if you have a program that's present in multiple states across the country and multiple counties, um, and you want to be able to view all of those individual counties and how they compare to one another across states at one time without having to search on the map. So here I could select multiple states like Alabama, Arizona, Arkansas and Florida and click apply. And then select which counties within those states I want to focus on so I can compare a few counties across those different states and click apply again. So here I'm able to see both on the map if I were to zoom out, but really in this bar graph um, exactly how the counties that I've selected compare to one another um, across different states. And again, if you don't want to have to go through this list and select individual counties, you can also always type into search um, and filter that way. So I can clear these filters here. All of the functionalities that I just showed you are available for each of the conditions on these blue buttons above. So all of the dashboards for each individual condition work the same way and will all have the same filters and functionality. We also have the comparison dashboard. Um, which I would like to briefly show you. This dashboard amasses all of the information across conditions in one place. At the top of the dashboard, you will see a filter to select which condition you would like to view. The states in the bar graph below are ordered from states with the lowest number of individuals screening positive on the condition selected per 100,000 people to highest. And the maps to the left are once again color coded in quartiles for the condition selected as well. So here you can see I have depression selected. Um, these states are sorted from um, Washington, D.C., which has the lowest number of individuals scoring with severe depression per 100,000 to the highest. If I were to select a different condition here, um, for example, suicide, then you'll see that these states reorder um, based on lowest to highest risk and the um, maps to the left have also changed color coding as well to reflect that condition. Um, you can also see all of the results within each state across the multiple conditions, which allows you to visualize what people may be struggling the most with in, in each state. So if I were to go back to depression here, I can immediately look at a state like Maine, for example, and see that the bar um, for the number of people identifying as trauma survivors per 100,000 people is much longer, and therefore there are many more people um, and higher risk there than the number of people scoring with severe depression per 100,000 population. So there I may immediately be able to pinpoint some of the um, conditions or areas that may need additional resources within each state. 
again, our hope for this dashboard is just to make this kind of mental health data more accessible to decision makers across the US so we can have a better understanding of mental health need, identify and implement policies, programs, and interventions um, that we can see being successful in certain areas across the US, and identify where we need to allocate additional resources to provide services and supports where they are most likely to reach populations in need. We have begun to think through specific examples of how this data can be used with a particular focus on research and policy, and you can find that on the policy page of our website, which I will link to in the chat. And also, if you are a researcher, policymaker, or any other kind of stakeholder, and you'd like to partner with us and work with us on this data to make change, please go to our connect page and fill out the form there. And I will also link to that in the chat. And now with that, I will turn it back over to Teresa um, so we can begin our Q&A. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? <laughs> um, okay, so how exciting that everyone is here to join us. Um, we're gonna open up the Q&A portion. And I think that, um, Maddie, I don't know the just to clarify for everyone from a technical standpoint, the 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 presentation you just saw from Maddie is going to be available on the website. So as soon as we kind of clean it up, we're going to put it up on the website. That way, if you're playing with a dashboard, I know some things are kind of confusing because we wanted to make sure it was just one dashboard place where you're you're in. But we had state data, we had county data. We're trying to talk to as many people as we can are using it to figure out the best way to present this data. So I just want to clarify that. Um, there are a lot of questions. So we're trying, we're going to try and get through as many as we can. And honestly, Maddie, if you're cool, I think we can stay on for as, as long as we can, because I have um, time and, and we want to just honor the space that people are here. If it comes to the top of the hour and you need to go, feel free to go and you certainly have our contact information. Um, Maddie is going to go ahead and type our emails into the, the chat box. And that way, if you're just really excited about something and you want to share your thoughts, you know, feel free to email us. Um, if you are a researcher or a person from a county, uh, these are the kinds of individuals we've had conversations about to help them use the tools along with our affiliates to really expand on what it might mean for, for funding resources in your community. And you can both email us or um, check out the website and there should be a link for a way for you to connect. So with that said, I'm gonna move us to the, um, the Q&A portion. Um, I think that a lot of people had questions about just how the dashboard functions. I, I'm gonna skip over those questions. Um, and if, you, if you're still around and you're still confused, we're certainly happy to help you. So I'm gonna jump to a couple of questions that I think are pertinent to both the way screening is collected, what we will choose to present or not present, why we made those decisions. Um, first question, Maddie, a couple of people asked about disability. So for example, do we have ans like do we have data about whether or not somebody identifies as having a disability, either a mental disability or a physical disability, chronic pain? And is there any way that there's going to be an examination of that data? I can answer that, but I'm actually going to have you answer that. Okay, perfect. I was going to say which one of us wants to take it. Um, we in our demographic questions, we don't currently have a question that asks specifically, do you have a disability? Um, but we do ask about any other um, co-occurring health conditions that a person may have. Again, that's a, a self-report question. Those questions are optional, so not everyone will answer those questions. But um, under that, we have a few um, health conditions that we saw coming up over and over again um, that we, we spotlighted for people to choose. One of those is arthritis or chronic pain, um, which about 30% of people who answer that co-occurring co -occurring health conditions question um, each year report that they experience chronic pain. Um, but we have all of those options under that question and then have um, an other response so that people can write in other health conditions that they're experiencing. Um, either physical or mental. Um, and we 
hopefully we'll um, be able to build in. I think this kind of covers a couple different questions that people asked about um, the different demographic information. Initially, we're, we're hoping to build in um, filters for really high level demographics like age and race um, at the state level, um, not at the county level, just because of um, data suppression um, to make sure that we're not um, violating anyone's privacy. Um, so at the state level, we'll start to look at that demographic information. Um, health conditions may be something that we add eventually, but for now we have examined our screening data for certain health conditions, like again, chronic pain in previous reports, which you can find on our website. Yeah. A couple of people asked us about um, whether or not this is a public resource and and then specific questions about how often we will be updating the data. Um, and so I'll go ahead and answer that. The, 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 the website that you see is available for anyone. So we created this as a public resource because we, in our current or past practice, we primarily worked with our affiliates or any researchers that we were working with who had access to the data. And when we were working with the CDC during the pandemic, it just felt like suddenly it was really important to try and figure out how to get this out to as many communities as possible. And so we started to just think about that and, and then executed this dashboard, which probably was more than we, we bit off more than we can chew. Is that the right idiom? I don't know, you know. So um, yeah, we, we, we do plan to update the data every other month is what we are trying to hit for. It's a bit of work and it's a lot of cleaning. A couple of some of the other questions that people had was, you know, how do you clean the data? What's ha what happens if somebody um, takes the screening over and over, which does happen actually regularly because this is just an open site. The methodology is in the, in the, on the page. Um, it's a tab that you can review. We The dashboard actually represents the cleanest set that we could possibly do. So we went through every single, we went through all the items and cleaned out repeat users. Uh, many of our affiliates actually promote screening. We took all of those out. So the data dashboard only represents the people who are coming naturally through Google. So some of the questions was around like the psychosis screen and what Maddie was saying about I see ghosts or I hear ghosts. One of the strategies we've developed is knowing that like people don't know how to ask these questions. They don't, I, certainly when I was struggling with depression, I did not have like the clinical knowledge to ask the questions that I needed to. And so we get a lot of data from our users with just what they're struggling. Like I think about death all the time. I don't want to die, but I, I want to, I feel like I want to die, you know, things like this. And we've used that to build out um, articles like an article that says, I see ghosts in hopes to capture young people who are looking for these questions and encouraging them to learn more and like, and, and, and certainly in the future, a lot of our research is going to be thinking about community practices and going to community to ask them the way that they experience mental health challenges and how that can funnel and feed our entire project. Um, in a similar vein, this is a question that I'm going to ask to Maddie. There are a lot of questions about LGBTQ youth. Um, what data have, have been gathered for LGBTQ youth? How do you how do you ask questions about sexual orientation or gender identity? And how might we be asking or presenting this data in the future? Yeah, currently um, we do ask um, if people identify as LGBTQ um, in the demographic questions. It's under our special populations question, um, which just says which of the following special populations do you identify with? Um, we have a number of things. I also saw like veterans, active duty military. Um, we have a bunch of different um, populations under that question, um, but that is where people can, can report that they identify as LGBTQ+. Um, if they do, we also currently have a question that pops up that asks um, if you'd like to report your, your sexual orientation. 
Um, so we are able to collect all of that data. We don't have it currently built into this dashboard again because we haven't um, started to broach putting in the, the demographics yet. We wanted to make sure that we could just get top line numbers to you all um, right away. But that is another um, population that we have explored in our screening data in the past. Um, so if you go and look at our past screening reports, we did um, a report on um, specifically LGBTQ plus mental health. Um, and the trends that we were seeing over time there. We did see um, throughout the 2020 and 2021 and in years before that, um, that LGBTQ plus youth definitely come up in our data um, a lot as, as screening really severe. Um, so that is a population that we are trying to build more resources towards specifically serving um, and hopefully we'll be able to, to release um, more data um, specific to LGBTQ plus youth in the future. Awesome. Um, I think it's worthwhile to talk about some really interesting questions about limitations and the directions that we might go. Uh, the first question was about, it, it appears that those that need services are not, are the, are most, the need services the most are not represented in the data as they will not voluntarily participate in data collection, maybe like homeless populations. This is actually, I'm going to answer this, Maddie. Um, th this is something that I think is especially important for our research goals. Um, the only, the way to access our screening program is just to have a phone. Um, as a person who's worked with people who are unhoused, um, I do know that many of them do have phones, especially our younger generation, it's the way that they keep in touch, but there certainly is a disparity in rural populations or certain areas of the country where it's harder to access Wi-Fi, for example. These are things that we've talked about uh, that are real challenges for gaps, and it's a limitation in our system. And uh, I think the only way to tackle that is to provide more money to these communities to build up their systems and to have researchers from those communities collaborate with us or in whatever extent that we can collaborate with them and be a resource for them. Certainly happy to explore those barriers and how to make sure we do the best job we can to, to, to identify the voices of the people who are left out and certainly in the spirit of MHA, like this, the lived experience that we have, which is the diversity of our brains and, and what we bring from our lives and how that impacts mental health. Um, because one of the other questions that I also think is very pertinent to this question is, is asking about whether or not there's bias in the data. Um, and I, I, just think that there is. You can't assume that there is not bias. If the system was built in our in our system today, there are inherently going to be biases. So one of the things that um, our team has spent a lot of time thinking about is the next steps of our work. And one area that I'm very excited about is um, increasing the number of community listening sessions that we have with people who are voice hearers, with people who experience trauma and child abuse, survivors, adult survivors of child abuse, um, people who come from different cultural communities and, and host, hosting listening sessions where we can just understand the barriers that they're facing to get to care, but also for people who live with conditions, how do they describe them? How are we doing a better job of understanding the way symptoms present? And how can we as an advocacy organization push those systems that use the tools like the PHQ-9 and the PQB when we go to a doctor's office to understand how these tools work for us or don't work for us. So this is very much um, some of the areas of research that we're interested in. So if you're an in a researcher interested in the same thing, we really do encourage you to connect with us because it's quite a huge endeavor to undertake and we don't wanna do that alone. So. Yeah, I, I was just going to say yeah. to add to that, that's um, from the research standpoint, Absolutely. Um, that is something that we're interesting, interested in partnering on. Um, but also from like a community provider or um, state stakeholder perspective, um, definitely we wanted to get this data just as a, a jumping off point so that you have access to this data, um, can download it, can use it, can see what we are collecting for your area. But 
Um, we're also hoping to keep working with counties, with states, um, and have this just be the beginning of this work to just kind of give a top level um, show of need in the area and then be able to partner with you to have more local listening sessions, um, explore what other data may be collected in your area and really um, start to translate this as a jumping off point into, like we said throughout the presentation, more programming, more resources, um, policy change in these areas, um, and would love to partner with you on that as well, if that's something you're interested in. And there's a specific question. A couple people talked about 988, Maddie. And I know that you have had spent a bit of time thinking about 988. Do you want to address how you think a dashboard like this can help a policy like 988 implementation? Sure. I mean, yes, we um, this is something that we put in that that policy section of the website, too, as as a specific example that we thought was really important in releasing this data. And you can see that on our site. Um, with 988 rollout, um, we think it is really important to look at, again, this kind of snapshot of need of how many people are going online and, and reporting that they are experiencing fre frequent suicidal ideation and are immediately looking for resources. And then compare that to things like um, which states have been able to fully fund um, 988 infrastructure or um, what those crisis resources look like on the ground in those counties, in those states, um, and use the data that you can see here to advocate for um, additional resources in areas that um, we can see may need them and may need them imminently um, since 988 is going to be rolled out in July. Um, so we definitely think that that's a really important use of this data. Um, and happy to share more data with anyone who is also working on 980 um, research and advocacy. Awesome. So I think it's important to honor privacy, um, privacy for our users. And someone did ask, do you store any kind of identifying info related to these screens? I know there are recent ethic and ethics and privacy concerns related to online text conversations with crisis text line. Um, Privacy is really important. Um, so we the screens are anonymous. So for our staff, you know, and 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 we do not share identifying information with anybody um, as part of our research projects. Um, we what we use is a hashtagging process. So you know, we talk to lawyers about what what's considered identifying inf information. How do we make sure we can protect people as much as possible? Um, so we make sure not to share any information that can be identifying. Um, Maddie mentioned like um, setting thresholds for suppression. So it's like all of a sudden, if you know that there's only one person in this county who identifies as Asian American, for example, it's very concerning that you could somebody could take a screen and suddenly I am the only person. And so part of the suppression process that we identified was, was to help us ensure that there was protection for people who were taking the screen. Um, otherwise the data that's provided is, um, is anonymous and confidentially provided. Also voluntary, I think that was very important for us when we built the screening program in 2014. And um, we weren't gonna require people to have to go through this process where they share their data. So on the screen, you can see users kind of see this blurb at the very top and it just like, you don't have to give us this data. You can totally just scroll down to the bottom and hit submit and never share anything at all and just get your results. But a lot of people do provide this demographic data. We make it clear that we do this to build out better resources on the screening site, along with working with researchers um, who are working with us. Um, somebody had a question about whether or not um, about research, if you are in research, um, we have a we work with university partners where we have IRB approval processes and care very much about like person centered informed consent. So pushing our researchers to think about the way that they're informing users who come to join a research project from our site, um, so that people are informed about what they're getting into and the way that we are um, experimenting with new different types of tools. So this might this is kind of an additional area where we're growing some of our, our work is after you take a screen, what else can you do? How are you on this site in, as a way to learn more about your mental health conditions or your trauma and, and what can we do to help people? So I am scrolling through as we continue to see. Um, 
I think this is good question. Um, how are you rating those at risk given the need for clinical face-to-face -face assessment to determine if someone should actually be diagnosed? How are you validating your data findings if they are based on self-assessment? Do you want me to take that one, Maddie, sure. as a clinician? So mm -hmm. the tools that are used are commonly used in primary care. They're intended to be screening tools and we designed them originally because we knew that people might print them or email them. That's an option. And we, we do see some people email us and, and email other people um, to share their screening results. We wanted someone to be able to walk into a doctor's off office, any doctor's office and have the tool that they printed out recognizable, which is why we use the PHQ-9 or the GAD-7, for example. There are some new screening tools that you know, the eating disorders is a good example where the previous eating disorders screen wasn't really working well for the eating disorders community. So we worked with NIDA and researchers at Stanford and some universities to develop a screening tool. And then through that process really worked on giving support to validate the data. We do have a couple publications similarly with the pediatric symptom checklist, for example, on that kind of validation. And we're looking at doing extra work with the psychosis screen. For example, people have talked about, you know, do people who are voice hearers experience symptoms the same way? These are the kinds of questions that we're starting to answer as part of our research work. Okay. Um, I think it's really important to answer this. So can you say more about your stakeholder engagement process? Maddie, do you wanna answer that question? Sure. Um, yeah, for our stakeholder engagement process, you can see on the homepage of the website, we, we listed everyone that we um, worked with throughout that whole process. So you can see across, um, across stakeholder groups who they were. Um, we hosted a different, um, pretty long listening session um, for each of the conditions that we ended up exploring on the dashboard. And uh, we made sure that we were inviting um, people from a bunch of different perspectives. So we looked at, um, we invited people from other advocacy organizations, um, from our federal partner groups, um, any industry, state, industry um, stakeholders, um, researchers, people that we knew had already been doing a lot of work um, for each of the conditions we were looking at. And we also really um, prioritized an equity lens. So making sure that we were um, reaching out to stakeholders in um, various different communities across um, different like race, ethnicity categories um, who were doing research specifically in mental health in those spaces so we could address things. I saw a couple of people talking about things like idioms of distress for different mental health conditions. How do we work that into our data? We wanted to make sure that we were getting all of those perspectives. Um, so we had um, a listening session with, um, with stakeholders for each of the conditions um, and then had briefs that you can also find on our website that we sent out to people, continued to receive feedback, um, had them preview the dashboard um, and really create this continuous feedback process so that we could um, make this as useful to people who also we knew um, would want to be using the data um, as possible. Um, and that being said, we are still open to anyone. I'm, I've been writing down your feedback that you've had in the chat um, throughout. Um, it's really useful for us to be able to build in um, these differing perspectives and, and different calls for languages and things like that. So thank you for your feedback as well. Um, and so I'm just going to note a uh, time check. Um, there was no end time. We weren't even sure how many people would come. <laughs> So um, I'm going to say, it, let, let Maddie, you and I, we are going to stay on for 15 more minutes and I'm going to do another time check for people where I'm going to let people go and you, anybody knows that they can leave, right? Um, and you have our contact information. If you ever want to just reach, reach out to us, maybe we didn't answer your question because there were quite a few and I know we will, will not have gotten to every single question. So um 
Maddie, do you want to offer your email? Or I'm totally happy to offer my email to answer any outstanding questions that we did not get to that's just burning for you inside. Um, Maddie will share our emails there now. Um, and while I answer some of the next questions, um, I saw a couple of questions about Hawaii and um, US territories. <laughs> and I think that we should talk about that. So the data for Hawaii and Alaska is available, but when we were doing the dashboard thing, it was, Tableau is awesome, but it was just like the way it distorted the map. It made everything very hard for everyone to read. <laughs> So um, we kind of had to zoom it out. But if you click on the states and you click on Hawaii, you should be able to access Hawaii data and Alaska data. Um, and we ask questions about people's demographics and do it, what race do you identify? These are examples of some, some of the demographics that we may be adding in over the next course of the year. Um, and that will include, for example, uh, race, maybe income. Somebody had a question about uh, income. How do you identify low income? That's federal low income, which is already too low. But, so, you know, we capture income. A lot of people say they make less than $40,000 annual household income a year. Uh, much of our data matches census, actually. So when we map it out by demographic across the country, we can see that a lot of it matches census. Um, and with the exception of gender, for example, um, LG and LGBTQ, there was a higher proportion of people who identified as LGBTQ. Um, and that was because our screeners typically are younger because that's when mental health challenges are kind of coming up. And so when we look at our LGBTQ data, it was like anywhere from 13 to 30%, depending on the year. And you can see over time, more young people identifying as LGBTQ. Similarly, our, our data has always skewed, skewed female. Um, someone mentioned like the importance of doing research on our men. And I think that is so true. So we've had some conversations about partnering with men organizations or how do we change the conversation in a way to help um, people who are male to take screens or understand their mental health conditions. Um, and so, that is a reflection on both uh, the kinds of data that we have and what we're presenting and also what we know are some disparities that we see. Um, okay, next question. Let's see. I think this is worthwhile because it's come up a couple times. So I wonder if the higher numbers are just a representation of greater numbers of individuals accessing help. That's it. I'm going to tell that to you, Maddie, as you listen to that. <laughs> Maybe the lower numbers are areas where people might not be at, taking online surveys. And similarly with suicidal ideation, someone had a very similar question, which is like, um, what, what, how do you make sense of this as like a, a convenient sample, right? As, as opposed to maybe even SAMHSA data, because people who are on the, on the call have maybe followed us and also see our data on state of mental health in America. Like what are, you know, what, how do we make sense of both the, the convenience sample of it? And then Maddie, I think it's worthwhile for you to go ahead and say anything about that state of mental health in America report and how it's different from this data. Yeah. Um, yes, we absolutely acknowledge that this is a convenient sample um, and it does skew toward um, higher severity because it is people who are seeking help for, for mental health conditions or for something that they're experiencing. So um, especially in this dashboard, because we did filter out all referred data, this is purely from people who are experiencing something with their mental health and are um, going on to search engines like Google or Bing and are, are actively looking for resources. Um, and so we do know that it is skewed um, high, it, toward higher severity than, um, than the data that you see from, from SAMHSA, which is um, like in their National Survey of Drug Use and Health, which is where they, they survey an entire representative sample as opposed to just a help-seeking sample. Um, because of that, though, we think this data is even 
even more important to us um, because it is showing that um, this is like the lowest number of individuals who are um, at really high risk and, and are in imminent need of resources. So um, like I said during my presentation, for every number of people that you see at a state and county level here, there are likely many, many more who um, are in need of resources and supports, but this is just reflecting people who are on the internet actively looking for some, some kind of information or resources to help with their mental health. Um, and, and so the need is likely even greater than what we're showing here. Um, the State of Mental Health in America report is different in that um, it is using data from federal agencies. So um, most of that data is taken from SAMHSA's National Survey of Drug Use and Health. Um, that is a more representative sample of an entire population. Um, and another key difference there is that it is um, only at the state level and um, it does face a, a time delay as opposed to um, the data that we're presenting here, which we're going to try to be updating um, as quickly as possible. So you're really seeing um, this need for people looking for resources um, in real time. The other thing that I think is really, really important about our data is, um, I know I'm repeating things that I said in my presentation, but um, that many of the people that come on and take a screen, um, over half of those who, who screen at risk um, have never received any kind of treatment or support of any kind um, in their lives for their mental health. So that's not only receiving a diagnosis or um, going into a health system. We ask just, have you received any kind of, of supports for your mental health in your life? And most people haven't. So um, a lot of other data sets that we have access to at the county and state level will be things like looking in health systems, um, looking for people who have been diagnosed. Um, this is capturing people who may not have ev ever told anyone about what they're experiencing yet or at the very beginning of their experience with a mental health condition um, and are just starting to Google their symptoms and, and look for that information. So um, that's also why we keep saying it's imminent need. It's, it's people who may not have um, told anyone about what they're experiencing yet or, or been able to access any resources, but may in the future um, if we're not able to, to serve them. Um, so that's one of the other key differences. Um, I did see someone ask if we're going to be incorporating this into the State of Mental Health in America report. Um, I don't think so. Um, we're going to keep those separate um, just, just so you have like multiple sources of information, but um, we do see some, some like key trends um, in the same direction from SAMHSA's data um, in comparison to our data areas that we see coming up as, as high need. Um, but yes, those will stay separate for now. Awesome. And I think we have one more um, time for one more question. And I see a couple of answer or questions that are related to um, who will collaborate around this data with? Are we working with the CDC? Um, an HR person asked, "How do I use this as an HR manager?" Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna close us off by talking about what we're doing, what we hope to do, and and wh where we might be going. Um, we we do work with the CDC um, because of this data it was the first time MHA could really have something that was epidemiological in nature that would uh, like give us a sense of working, who we were working with in the federal government. Um, Cause we have a longstanding relationship with other federal partners like SAMHSA or NIMH around research um, with COVID and the CDC was someone we really started to work with more extensively. And there have been conversations about what we might be able to do collectively. Um, they have referred us to research partners who are looking at suicide, for example, and whether or not our data can be used to better predict suicide. And that was, you know, we, the researchers there um, have told us that there are some interesting findings. So we're really eager to wait to see what's gonna come out of that research. Um, we, 
we have a current slate of research right now. Most of the research priorities have been set by gaps that we see um, in need of research or, or also what the data has led us to understand or need to look at investment in. So an example of that is we really want to see more research on voice hearing and, and understanding how we can serve people in an online space who are struggling with psychosis like experiences for the first time or with our LGBTQ population because so many of our young individuals and individuals who identify as LGBTQ are reporting higher rates of distress and understandably less likely to have um, security about how they're supposed to access care or finding culturally responsive care. We're also doing a, increasingly, um, I think in the next couple of years, we're going to do a lot more research in um, building culturally responsive resources for individuals and communities and families um, and how screening itself is a an entree point for people who are just trying to understand or make sense of their symptoms and how are uh, like parents of children uh, who may not be monolingual English, English speakers uh, thinking about this, right? Um, we may also be looking at school-based work. So a couple of people talked about school-based resources. Uh, we are trying to think about how our resources can be used for school systems or used by coaches. People have talked about that. Um, and so these are just an example of, of where we are right now. We have a link on the site um, on the connect page. And I don't know if that's fully up yet, Maddie, because if it is, I think it's worthwhile to put that link for anybody who stayed on, um, who wants to use that form to connect with us. Um, and feel free to send us your ideas about what you might be interested in from a research standpoint. We will expect to go through a full data use agreement and understanding what being charged with our data means. Um, and that's kind of part, part of the questions that we'll talk to any researcher about is what is it that you want to research and how will you use our data? How is it protected? Um, let's see here. I, I see some people answering questions. I know someone was asking about volunteering. Um, our affiliate network is the most amazing network I've been with. I come from affiliate networks across the country, and I think that they do such amazing work that if you want to reach out to your local affiliate, many of them have amazing um, volunteer opportunities. At National, we've had volunteers come when we do local events um, or when we do an event in community where we might be going somewhere, we will often find volunteers from that community to help us to run our events. Um, but you can certainly look at the info page on MHA's main website, uh, mhanational.org to explore any volunteer opportunities you might have there. Woo, how are you feeling, Maddie? <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, thank you for all of your questions. It was way more questions than we thought we would get. And I know we um, weren't able to answer everything. We, I tried to bucket them as well as I could um, to answer similar like questions in this space. But as I said, we've um, provided uh, our email addresses, our website. Uh, if you have a dying question, we're happy to answer them. I also already see people. Um, I already see people who um, are are, are emailing us about edits. And I think that's so important too, because we want to make sure that the dashboard itself is representative of what you know is important for your community. So especially from our affiliates who are using the dashboard, you know, let's, let's talk about how it's presented here and, and clarify any questions. We, we did some of that with some of our affiliates. So uh, even if you're not an affiliate and you, a couple of people have talked about Harris County and Houston, let's take a look at that and see if we can do that better. Um, Dolores is asking about our email. So we'll post that one more time. There it is. There's our email. Um, Dolores, uh, Gordon, you asked how many people attended. Uh, was it like 1200? <laughs> Something like that. 1200 people who attended, which is amazing. I'm trying to know if I should be horribly anxious about that or very proud of our work. So, <laughs> um, we thank you all for attending. Um, I think Maddie and I are going to go sleep a little bit. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs>
<laughs> we love this work and we're so happy to do it. We feel a heavy responsibility of what people have shared with us about their experiences on the online space. And I know Maddie and I are, it's what keeps us up at night. You know, it's, are we doing a good job um, to be charges of what people have given us as this gift? And how can we make sure that every day we're doing a good job about bringing it back to community and doing the work that we know is so important um, to help people find meaning and healing when they need it the most, which for our screeners looks like it's about somewhere between 12 and 16 years old. So I know Maddie, you very intimately know what that feels like as a young person to struggle alone. And I think those are the reasons we do what we do. So Thank you everybody so very much for joining us today. We will um, we will post some things online. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye.